in a world where trauma is real. Where people seek out distraction from their internal lives and relationships with others. And where no one is taught healthy self-care. Help was needed. In 2019, the mission began. Find a way to help people understand and better their mental health. Seek out ways to explore relationships and how they work. Fight against the stigmas that surround counseling and therapy. And most importantly, do all of that so you don't have to be a therapist to understand it. Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome to Season 2 of Therapist Theater. I'm your host, Josh Treese. I'm a practicing therapist in Music City, USA, and every week a guest therapist, counselor, or social worker joins me here in the theater to talk about a movie that we've seen and what relationships or mental health issues it highlights. Today's guest in the theater is Janine Herskovitz. Janine owns and operates her own private practice in Florida that specializes in providing families with all of the things she wished she had in her family's journey when her son was diagnosed with autism. She also hosts her own podcast called Autism Blueprint, where she uses her personal experiences as a mom and expertise as a psychotherapist to help Spectrum families. Thanks so much for downloading today's show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. And while you're doing that, help other people find the show by giving it a five-star rating and writing a review for it in the podcast app. We came over to sit. That's what people do when tragedy strikes. They come over and dim the lights, raise the curtain, and start the previews. Welcome to the theater. Janine. Hi. How are you this morning? I'm good. How are you, Josh? I am doing great. So you are you are in the future. You're one hour ahead. Um, <laughs> I am in the future, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have hoverboards yet? Uh, we do. We do have hoverboards. Oh, I knew it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We have hover um, surfboards because I'm in northern Florida. So. Wow. Are you on the panhandle? No, no. I'm on the east coast. Oh, cool. Yep, yep. I'm about a, okay. um, just right outside of Jacksonville. Okay, yeah. Uh, one of my uncles used to live right there. And I had a, um, one of my groomsmen lived in whatever the town is just on the Georgia side right there. Okay. Um, how's the weather? Oh, it's beautiful. It's, yeah. it's a little chilly today. It's in the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> we, so I'm okay. Wearing, I'm wearing so, socks today, which is a oh, first because, you know, right. if it goes below 70, I put socks on. There you go. Um, well, I spent six years hard time in Southern California, so I definitely nice. miss that. Right now in Nashville, it is snowing outside. Mm. Um, I would say for the first time this year, but the year's pretty young. So it, it's like really the first time, I mean, I think even in the past year that it snowed. Wow. Um, and so it's like in the, it's 21 outside right now. So <gasps> Holy <Yeah>. cow. <laughs> That's and, chilly. Yeah, and literally like three days ago, it was like 65. Wow. So I don't know what's going on. Huh. Global warming probably. Yeah, absolutely. We can just blame it all on that. That's all right. I think so. I think it's fair. I I um, my, my wife loves snow. I can't stand it. And so this morning she yeah. woke up as if, as if rising at the beginning of a Disney movie. Um, <laughs> and then... <laughs> and, and then I'm like downstairs like the Grinch throwing open the curtains and growling. Nice. <laughs> so we Very have different good. outlooks, and our yeah. dog, for some reason, doesn't like it either. So she's Aww. a bit she's a bit outnumbered. <laughs> um. So I like to start out every conversation with finding out a little bit about my guest and uh, asking them why therapy. Why do you do what you do? 
Well, um, I became a therapist about 10 years ago. So a, a little bit later in, in life, I had, um, I started out as a special education teacher and then had my kids and decided to stay home with them. And then my son, um, who's now 22, was when he was diagnosed with autism, I decided to stay home with him um, because it was just easier. And during my journey as a autism parent, I had a um, really severe depression and went to therapy myself. And this was, you know, I this was in the early 2000s. So um, at that time, once I got better and this therapist helped me so much, I thought, wow, I like this is something that I would love to be able to help people with. Um, and I actually talked to my therapist about going back to grad school. And she was like, yeah, that's a great idea. Um, well, at the time, I had two children, again, one with autism, one two years younger, and they were both entering puberty. And when I look back on it now, Josh, I'm just like, how the heck did I do that? Oh, yeah, um, you're brave. Oh, my gosh. But I literally <laughs> took one class at a time. And so it took me about five years to get my master's mm -hmm. degree because I just thought, I'm just going to plug along until I get done. And, you know, eventually you get done. And um and I did, and I had the opportunity to have an office in my um, my son's doctor, who's a functional medicine doctor, had space in her office. And mm -hmm. I just saw this gap in the in the autism and special needs world. There was all this therapy for the children, but not a lot of support for the parents. So that became my instant um, niche is working with autism families to help them kind of navigate um, the mental health piece of the journey. Yeah. Wow. Uh, tell me, what's a functional needs doctor? Um, a functional medicine doctor is a doctor that has additional training um, in how the body works as far as um, you'd think they'd get that in med school. But yeah. um, I guess what I mean is how the body metabolizes um, food and medicines and nutrients and um, you know, it's it's more of a looking at the body and seeing what does it make and what doesn't it make and how to help it okay. do a better job of doing that. So is it maybe would they specialize a little more in nutrition? Yes, a lot more okay. in nutrition, a lot more with using, um, you know, using a combination of traditional pharmaceutical medications and then also supplementation, whether that be through diet or through um, supplements that you can take. Wow. Um, and it's just it's made a tremendous difference in my son's life and in my life. Um, I had horrific chronic fatigue and thyroid disease and a whole bunch of other fun stuff um, that this, the functional medicine doctor has really helped me with. So. Wow. Yeah, it's That's incredible. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, I might need to find a functional medicine doctor. Um, yeah. So, uh, so you have an office in, uh, uh, I guess, in addition to with the functional medicine doctor in the same suite? Um, I'm actually in, we're separate, but in the same building. So okay. I'm okay. in the, the suite right next door to hers. Um, it's a, I mean, it's a very uh, humble little um, little office. It's interesting because we're in Ponte Vedra, Florida, which is a beach community just um, next to Jacksonville Beach, and it's um it's an upper upper middle class to upper you know yeah end of the spectrum as far as um, financially. But our little place, it's just a little um, ranch style house. And um, she's the door on the right when you go to the porch, and I'm the door on the left. And it's oh, nice. Just, she has half the house, and I have half the house, but it's little. So um, okay. it's like a little family, and we co-treat sometimes because she specializes in autism um, from the functional medicine perspective. So Very um, cool. Yeah, so it's it's really fun. And then I we do I have a therapist on staff um, named Catherine, and she um, does most of my teens and kiddos, and she's wonderful. So she's marriage and family therapy, and I'm mental health. Nice. Um, we've got a really nice combination. Yeah. I w well, I was going to ask if you uh, ever partner with the functional uh, medicine doctor, because it seems like that would be something very beneficial in. Um, one of the things that I'm learning as I get a chance to talk with social workers is that it seems like, um, you know, in addition to uh, potentially doing some counseling themselves, they also have a resourcing component. Mm. Um and so, you know, it seems like, at least in my experience as a brother of a person with autism, um, 
the resourcing component is something that I'm always hungry for. Yes. And so I, I could imagine that other, you know, folks would feel the same way. So um, I'm sure that, you know, that it, it's super, <laughs> super awesome being next to a person who helps you so much. Yes. Yeah. And being it, able to point to great. them. Yeah. And it's just, a, it's a lot of fun just as a therapist to, to know that, um, you know, if I have a client who is extra anxious this week than they were last week, I can check in with the doctor next door who I know treats that and let them know what's going on. And we can tweak the supplements or the medications that they're on without them having to make a whole other appointment. Wow. That's cool. So, yeah. It's, it's very cool. I just, I love what I do. Huh. Um, I feel like this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship because I, so I am an MFT, graduated from grad school at the end of 17 mm -hmm. and want to go on to a PhD at some point. That some point is not anytime soon, but some point. Uh, and the one idea that I've had for research so far was to... Um, using attachment theory, uh, try to develop interventions uh, that would um, help grow, uh, sustain, and improve the health of the attachments of a nuclear family living with a loved one with autism. Oh, that's brilliant. Uh, and to see if that uh, helps them um, uh, you know, relieve stress, uh, deal better to see if that, um, just kind of helps with the, uh, I don't want to say special, but I guess specific challenges that come mm -hmm. with, uh, that particular setup. Oh, I've got goosebumps. <laughs> Such a dork. I'm like, yes, I'm so excited that you're talking about this because, um, I, it's, it dawned on me a few years ago when I started working with autism families and their kids and then I was also working with um, neurotypical kids who had been adopted. And the behaviors in, in the two were so aligned in so huh. many ways. And I thought, gosh, would it be safe to say that kids with autism have a difficult time attaching due to the nature of the disability and the, in, mm. you know, the difficulties with communication? The, you know, because attachment's all about child cries out, mom responds, right? In, in the simplest mm -hmm. terms. And it's really hard to respond to a child that isn't communicating properly. Yeah, or quote unquote properly. Right, quote unquote um, properly, exactly. Yeah. I, um, so our, uh, my wife's brother, my brother-in-law, he and his wife uh, just had a kid last April. Um, and we went up to visit a couple of weeks after he was born. Um, his his kid, not her brother. And um, uh, one of the things, it just seemed like he and his wife just took to parenting the easiest that I've ever seen anybody do it. Wow. And at some point, which is which is a facade, like he, I said that to him and he was like, no, that, that's a facade. You're catching this at good times. <laughs> um, but he said, uh, he goes, you know, it's a lot easier than I thought it would be. Like when he cries, there's only three things it could be. He's either tired, he's either hungry, or he has to poop. Yeah. Um, or he is pooping, I guess. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, all of that comes from, at least on like a instinctual level, you know, his son kind of knowing what it is that he wants right. and doing the thing that gets him what he wants. Yes. And so with an individual with autism, it's not necessarily that way. Um, I've oftentimes said that once Caleb um, became more verbal, um, he still had trouble communicating what was going on inside of him. So yes. And you know what, Josh, I find that's true in, um, in my clients with what used to be called Asperger's. Um, yeah. I still call it Asperger's because a lot of my clients want me to, mm -hmm. um, it, with those, um, patients, sometimes they'll have plenty of verbal ability but especially describing how they feel about something or what they think about something. It's not that they don't feel or think it, it's that they have trouble articulating it. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I remember in which, which, uh, we talked about this on your show, the book, the reason I jump, uh, the young man that they were interviewing in there, he kind of described it as, you know, somebody will ask him a question and he'll have an answer. 
to that question. But in the process of that answer getting from his brain to his mouth, it's like it gets lost. Yes. Or it's like, you know, blocks appear or something. Yes. And I know yes. that um, a lot of times with my brother, uh, you know, my mom has said like, oh, well, you're so good at, you know, helping him understand and getting answers out of him and all that. And I said, it's just because I don't give up. So if I ask him a question and, you know, I can see he's thinking about it. And then if he gets distracted and says something different or, or gives me a line from a movie or something, I just ask him again. Yes. And I never ask him out of, or I try to never ask him out of frustration. I try to never, you know, hey, I, you know, we were talking about this, that, or the other, but just kind of, kind of like a gentle reminder, yep. like, uh, like the uh, inflatable bumpers on a bowling alley, you know, just, <laughs> just kind of, hey, a little more this way, a little more that way. This is, remember, remember we were talking about this. Let's talk about you know, Ernest goes to camp in a second, but we're trying to figure out where we're going to go to lunch. Right. You know, kind of thing. Yep. Yeah. So like, I mean, I've been thinking, you know, what would, what would, uh, attachment therapy do for the family? Mm -hmm. Just because I know that, um, I mean, having, you know, grown up with a, a family member, it does produce stresses that are a little bit unique. Very much so. Yes. Yes. Unique and sometimes feels like it's never ending. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, uh, you know, because this is a person that you love. Right. So it's not like, uh, you know, being in high school and hating it and having a countdown knowing, okay, in four years and six months, I'm out of here. Yes. You know, it's, um, this is somebody that's in my life. And yeah, absolutely. I'm not, I'm not trying to get away from them. I'm trying to figure out like how how I can help them live their life as well as how I can live my life and how we can do that together. Oh, and so right there, you just described exactly what I do in my office because I think that was the part that I had the most trouble with when my son was diagnosed. Huh. It was kind of like, um, you know, we, we kept trying for a really long time to live the life that we planned to live in our minds, me and my husband. Mm -hmm. um, Rather than going, okay, we've got a son that has these needs. How do we, how do we create a new normal? Yeah. Because this isn't it. And, and as hard as we try, it, it's not going to be what we thought. So there was a lot of grieving that had to go on grieving. Um, I felt like grieving the loss of a child that I started to get to know because with my son, he was born in 97 and he, over the course of the first two years of his life, had milestones that he reached waving goodbye, things like that. Um, and then lost them, had some language and then lost Aww. it. So we watched him over the course of a year, just deteriorate before our eyes. And so as a mom, you're like, something is wrong. Yeah. Um, no one believes me because that doesn't happen. Kids don't reach milestones in 1997, 98 and then lose them. Now we know that that happens. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and a lot of times we look at autism to see if that's a culprit. And um, in our case, it was. And it wasn't. I'm finding out now because my son has the ability to speak some, but also type. And we're finding out now that it's not like he lost the he lost the skills he lost the ability to express the skills huh. so a lot of autism what i'm finding out is um a lot of it's a movement disorder in that the same way that they can't always get the words out that are in their heads they can't always get their bodies to do what they want them to do um so a lot of times if say my son is sitting in the bathtub and i say okay it's time to get out now he knows it's time to get out now and he actually let me change that. I would never say to him, it's time to get out now. Cause he'd be like, okay, cool. It's time. But that didn't mean that I wanted him to stand up and get out. Sure. So I have to be specific with him and say, okay, it's time for you to stand up now and get out of the tub and dry off. Cause a mm -hmm. lot of times it's very literal. Yes. Um, so even if I say that, if I say, come on, Ben, stand up, he knows he wants to stand up, but he can't get the message from his head to his legs so oh. often. And so when I started, um, you know, I learned this both from a typing instructor and from an OT, occupational therapist, when I say to him instead, okay, um, are you ready to get out now? And he says, yes. And I say, okay, do you need some help? And he'll often say yes or no. Um, and then I'll say, okay, bend your legs. Okay, now stand up. 
And so sometimes talking them through that, it's kind of like if I've got a pen sitting on the table and you say, okay, Janine, take this piece of paper and write your name. I know by default, that means my hand has to reach for the pen. It has to press all of the steps in between. Yeah. All of that stuff. But um, sometimes in people with autism, that either doesn't happen or then they want it to happen and it's not happening. So sometimes it almost, yeah, through. it almost seems like it's, it's a disorder involving connections. It's absolutely that. Yes. As, as if like, you know, it, it, it's tough to connect with my emotions. It's tough to connect with my thoughts. It's tough to have the connection run between my heart and my mouth, my, my brain and my mouth and, and my brain and my body parts, you know, mm -hmm. And I mean, we know from research, we know from experience, it's tough for them to sometimes make personal connections, relationships. That's right. Yep. Because all of those skills that you just mentioned are required to have a successful relationship. Yeah. And also, I mean, so many times, and, and I, I don't know if this is specific to America where we are, but so many times, you know, we build relationships on these cues that we receive from another person that are oftentimes nonverbal, uh, body language, facial expression, voice tone, things like that, that individuals with autism have a tough time picking up on. Right. Exactly. Huh. Wow. Yeah. Um, are there any, I guess, maybe common issues that families come to you struggling to learn how to deal with? Yes. Um, the one I see the most is I've got a new diagnosis and what, what do I do now? So first uh, steps. Yeah. So first steps, but usually it's that person is sent to me by either the doctor next door or another doctor in the community that knows about me because gotcha. sometimes you don't even know what you don't know. And yeah. I didn't know that was something that I would need help with, you know, as a new mom. So um, that's one area. The other is, you know, my kid is doing X, Y, Z or not doing X, Y, Z. How do I get them to stop? Mm -hmm. um, and once they get into my office and realize that we're, we're not going to make them stop, but I can help <laughs> them <laughs> fix my kid, right? How often do we hear that? Yeah. Um, it's, you know, so I, I hear a lot of that. Um, and then also a lot of kiddos um, that have either depression, extreme depression or extreme anxiety. So there's a lot of depression and anxiety that happens um, in autism spectrum patients. With the actual individual. With the individual, yes. Yeah. With the parents I, too. With the parents yeah. too. Yeah. I got to say though, I mean, that makes the most sense to me because if you, in your interior world you know, are, are thinking through a message that you want to communicate, but you can't get it out. Mm -hmm. And as a result, people respond to you and treat you differently. Yes. You know, I could definitely see that. Like, I, I mean, I even remember, you know, to reference it again, the reason I jump, you know, one of the things that the young man said in that book was, you know, please, you know, I can see you getting frustrated when you're trying to talk to me. Um, and then, you know, sometimes you'll give up on me and you'll just do something yourself to speed up the process. He goes, but that that makes me feel uh, worthless and it makes me feel depressed yes. because it feels like you don't believe in me. Mm. Yes, absolutely. So unfortunately, people on the autism spectrum sometimes get a double whammy of environment that what you just described experiences and then also biochemistry. So I've learned from the functional medicine doctor that biochemically, sometimes the chemicals like serotonin or GABA or dopamine are not always in alignment or in balance. Um, some of them have difficulty um, detoxifying or methylating, they call it in functional medicine, which is your body's ability to take out the trash. Um, some of them have chronic other illnesses, chronic constipation, sometimes chronic diarrhea, sometimes um, headaches and stomach aches that are kind of all interrelated to those connections just not being made well in the body. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's, uh, unfortunately, I'm also, um, I'm trained, well, fortunately, I'm trained in um, EMDR therapy for post-traumatic stress disorder. And I did that because I started noticing that an inordinate amount of the parents and the kiddos had PTSD symptoms. And so that's huh. been 
really helpful. Because think about it, like you were just describing, if you're trying to express yourself and can't, or people misunderstand you all the time, sometimes they can mistreat you. Yeah. You know, I've had um, kiddos come in and, and on countless occasions and tell me, um, I can't stop thinking about that teacher that thought I wasn't paying attention and then got angry because I, he, she thought I wasn't, but I was, and I couldn't tell her or I couldn't yeah. explain it. I tried to tell her, but she wouldn't listen. That uh, is something that I have never thought about. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a big, um, it's a big issue. And I think that a lot of times, I think this is true with my son as well. Um, that when I see what we would consider a meltdown or an outburst, that we're really seeing a panic attack due to PTSD. Yeah. A lot of times I think that that's what I'm seeing. Wow. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I think gave me a lot of hope in my uh, life and in my relationship with my brother was, I, I mean, you know, listen, I'm harping on this book. I'm going to link to it in the show notes, but like in the right reason on. I, in the reason I jump, uh, it, uh, and, and I guess I, I think I've mentioned it on the show before, but it's, it's a book that is basically an interview with a young man with autism who is using a simplified keyboard to communicate his thoughts. And, and each page, you know, at the top, they'll ask him a question and then it'll have his answer underneath it. And one of the questions that they asked, and I'll, I'll never forget, I was in my room at my desk reading it because I started, I just burst out crying. Mm -hmm. But they, they asked him, you know, why do you flap your hands in front of your face? And he said that when he feels anxious, he'll close his eyes and he'll kind of flap his fingers in front of them. And the shadows of his fingers running across his eyelids, he can see those. And it helps. Mm -hmm. It's a soothing behavior. It's a yes. self-regulating behavior. And up until that moment, I always thought that was something that Caleb did specifically. Yeah. I, I never knew that that was something that anybody else in the entire world did. And so for me, it felt like it, it was like a big realization but it also felt like a connection to a bigger world. Oh, you know what? I'm so glad you said that, Josh, because one of the things that I love about my job is connecting parents with other parents. Yeah. And so I've done a, um, a support group um, since I was in grad school for, aut for autism moms specifically, but then for parents and professionals, I have a podcast autism blueprint and also a private Facebook group for them where they can know that they're not alone because that it, like, like you just described, wow, I'm, my brother's not the only kid that does this. Um, and in kind, when you've got a situation as a parent and you're trying to get used to this, to hear other parents having the same, maybe dark thoughts that you're having is very comforting. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Dark thoughts. Mm -hmm. I would imagine, mainly because I, it, it has been me, so I don't have to imagine, but one of the issues that um, comes into the office quite a bit are maybe people feeling maybe shame and guilt for thoughts or feelings that they have in regards to their loved one. Right. Right. Because there's such a, it's such a double-edged sword. It's, it's, okay, I'm feeling this way but I don't want my child to feel it and I don't want them to think it's them or it's their fault. So then I feel guilty because my child can't help it, but yet I'm so sad they have this problem. What do you find has been most helpful for you as the mom of a kiddo with autism to, to maybe know where to keep in mind or something that's helped you on your journey? Wow. That's a good question. Um, because there's so many things, but the first thing that comes to mind is um, things didn't get better for me until I did my own work. Meaning when I went to therapy yeah. and got myself, my anxiety, which I didn't even know I had, by the way, I thought I was just Italian. Um, <laughs> <laughs> turns out it's an anxiety disorder. Uh, but when you're half Italian, I guess, you know, you get that passed on because it, it was my normal, right? <laughs> Everybody in our house kind of yelled and, and, you know, but anyway, I'm digressing. Yeah. Um, once I treated that uh, and learned how to deal with one, my anxiety, two, my depression, three, my perfectionism, there was all the stuff that started coming out, right? And then just being able to become more authentic as a person, um, then I think I became a better mom. And I think that's true for any parent. 
I really think if there's a secret to parenting, it's do your own work. Because you oh, can't. Oh, I've had many friends with kids say that to me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can't pass down what you don't know. And the way that we attach to our babies and to our children is through reg- co regulation. And if we are not mm-hmm. regulated, we can't expect our child to regulate. And you know what's interesting? You said you can't pass down what you don't know. You will inevitably pass down what you are unaware of inside of yourself. Absolutely. So, so if you've got, you know, all of this anxiety and really what, what I've heard the most from my friends is shame. Mm-hmm. If you've got a lot of shame that you either are unable to or unwilling to address, inevitably that, that you know, that's going to try to get transferred, you know, to your loved ones in a way that looks a lot like uh, anger or rage. Totally. Yep. And that's not to say that, you know, the person who's struggling with that's a bad person. Uh, far from it, you know. It's just to say that kind of the inverse of what you were saying, it's that it's that uh, if I'm not aware of what's going on inside of me, it's still there. It's still happening. Yes. Right. I'm just unaware of it. Yes. So to kind of piggyback on, on that answer to your question, once I did my own work, then I could connect with other people more effectively, ask for help when I needed it. Um, take some time for myself, set healthy boundaries. You know, all of these things are things that I had to learn how to do in order to Mm -hmm. be a better parent. And it's especially true for a special needs parent. Yeah. Um, Yeah. A little bit of a uh, hypothetical. Do you think that you would have been motivated to do that work had your son been typical? I do not. I do not huh. think I would have been motivated. I, I mean, maybe it would have been some other big pain in my life. But um, that was, well, because I often say autism doesn't cause problems in in your mental health. It doesn't cause problems in your relationship. It just shines a big spotlight on them. Mm-hmm. They've already been there or they're being brought to the surface. So when my husband and I started going downhill in our marriage, I was like, oh, it's the autism's fault. Like, that's that's the problem. And it wasn't. It was these were the habits that we already had and the things that we already brought into the marriage. And yeah. now it's just shining a big light on them because the stress is so, so much. Yeah. In, so, uh, yeah, in- I, I don't think I I don't think that I would have worked as hard as I did to uh, on my own on myself if it weren't for that or some other stressor. Yeah. In the in the MFT family systems world, you know, we would look at the person like your son in this case, uh, calling them the symptom bearer. So yeah. oftentimes, you know, a family will come in and they'll say, well, you know, hey, if you can just fix this one person then everything <laughs> right. will be great, you know, yes. but really what's happening is it's, it's just, you know, the issues that are happening, you know, uh, I, will, I don't want to say that they're manifesting in the symptom bearer, but everybody is looking at them as kind of a scapegoat. Exactly. Um, and yeah. and usually, you know, 99 times out of 100, it's it, it, it's not a matter of working with the symptom bearer. If anything, it's, it's almost like uh, you're a detective and you talk to them to get more information to then look back at the bigger group and go, all right, guys, we're working on you here. Right. Um, Was it a difficult journey to get to a place of gratitude for Mm. your son? That's very personal. I I, I apologize if that's too. No, no, don't don't apologize. I'm an open book. In fact, um, anybody that listens to my podcast or has read my writing knows that I share like way too much about, (laughs) about my home life because I feel like if somebody can benefit from it, that's that just makes it feel like it's been worth experiencing for me. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, uh, yeah, getting you know what I think it was is that I re, when I realized the benefit of gratitude, and for me it was like I started reading you know the research on gratitude, right, or listening to Brene Brown speak, um, and I realized okay, if I can kind of shift my thinking, I have a choice over what to focus on. And really that's how I see gratitude. It's you can focus on what you don't have or you can focus on what you have. Mm-hmm. And so that gratitude, um, that it was, 
it was hard to get to, but once I realized I had to, then it, then it was easy, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Because I think there's so much about my son that I absolutely love, um, that, you know, that, that is kind of part of his autism. Um, it's interesting because I, I, a lot of people say, oh, we have to separate, you know, that first person language, got to separate the autism from the person and people with autism will say, no, most of the people I've talked to with autism and the research bears this out too, by the way, will say, you can call me autistic. Like that's fine. We don't have to do mm -hmm. person with autism because this is part of who I am. It's become part of my identity. Um, and so I, I just have come to appreciate that my son is so intelligent, so smart, and so resourceful that he can think to do something like you were describing your brother does, you know, flick his fingers in front of his eyes to create a self-soothing mechanism. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's brilliant. You know, I want to be able to appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it makes him, you know, to quote another book that we talked about in your show, uniquely human. Yes. It's a part, it's a part of his experience. It's a part of him. That's a, you know, you mentioned earlier, um, the clients that you have who were diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, when they updated the DSM from the DSM four, whatever the second part of it was to the DSM five, they removed Asperger's syndrome from it mm -hmm. and just included it with, you know, as a part of the autism spectrum. And I remember reading that a lot of people who had been diagnosed with Asperger's uh, protested that. Mm -hmm. And it was because they had done so much work to integrate, to, you know, try to help or try to make, hmm, try to bring this thing into their identity, try to accept it, try to learn how to deal with it and live with it. And then all of a sudden, you know, the mental health community says, ah, that's not a real thing. Right. Right. Instead, it's all under this autistic umbrella when, uh, honestly, I can tell you from working with these clients long enough, there is a significant difference. There's some overlap, but there is a significant difference between someone with full-blown autism and someone with Asperger's. And, it, mm. and I think it's more than just a severity level. Hmm. Is there, if, if we're not thinking about a, kind of a spectrum definition, is there a way to kind of maybe boil down those differences instead of just high-functioning, low-functioning? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I kind of, I, I see it less of a spectrum. So if you p picture a spectrum kind of in a straight line where you've got mm -hmm. lowest to highest, I, I think that's a really bad picture of what it is. I think it's more of a spider web. So it's more oh. of like a web with things that overlie on top of it. And so a person might have difficulty in one area of the web of like, um, say, communicating verbally right or maybe they can communicate better through um through sign language or through typing but then there's this other part of the web that talks about expressing wants and needs that works really well and another part that talks about expressing feelings and having relationships and reciprocal conversation and that doesn't function at all so you've got like all of these different areas even within something as as uh, complex as language like we used to simplify it and go verbal nonverbal. Is mm -hmm. the person verbal? Is the person nonverbal? Well, it's not that easy. My son is extremely verbal. He talks all the time, usually scripts <laughs> from movies <laughs> or yeah. scripts from TV shows or books. Um, he'll use it to try to get his point across, but he definitely can speak. Um, yeah. Now, can we have a conversation? Like sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. It's Sometimes it's all over the map. And then I have other friends who have children who cannot speak to communicate at all but they communicate so eloquently through typing. Yeah. So it's just, it's kind of an all over the map kind of thing. So it's, it's hard. But to, to answer your question about like Asperger's autism, the people that I've met that have qualified for Asperger's um, diagnoses, they function as far as daily life, holding down a job, going to school, things like that, really, really, really well. But the on the outside, but the amount of energy it takes from them is tremendous. Huh. So I almost like it, a uh, almost like this is a terrible comparison, but I'm still going to make it almost like an introvert mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. you know, uh, gaining their energy from solitude, spending it on social interaction, um, but just with, you know, the majority of their life. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a decent analogy. I'm um, taking it one step further back to what you said about connections or like connections in the body and things like that. They're really good at kind of mimicking connection, masking like I'm having a connection with you, but they aren't mm-hmm. actually experiencing that connection the way they're supposed to, ideally. Um, but huh. they can they can mask it, you know, like you, and they might kind kind of come across as like maybe a little bit. Uh, nerdy or maybe a little bit you know um they might have these special interests they call them um where they like to talk about the same things all the time but really it's just a way to be able to connect in a way that they're able to connect you know what's so strange is that many of the things that we're talking about right now you know you can see in a neurotypical person at different stages of their development So Mm -hmm. like when I was a youth pastor working with middle school students, I had a volunteer who uh, came to a a field day kind of games day that we did. And, you know, we were playing this one game where the students and volunteers would lie on their stomach on the grass and and face one way and I would stand behind them and I had these road cones. So it's kind of like musical chairs where you had five cones at first, you had one less than every person. You'd put them in different spots and then when you tweeted a whistle, they had to run and, and grab a cone or else you were out. So this volunteer was playing it with the kids and she ran for a cone, a kid ran for a cone and either she got it or the kid, I can't remember who got it, but in the weeks following, every Sunday, he would come up to her in the student's room and say, hey, remember that game that we did? You know, remember that game with the cones? And she came up to me, you know, one day and said, you know, oh my gosh, that's, it's all this kid will talk about is this game. Yeah. And I said, well, yeah, you're like, you're like a woman in her mid to late 20s and he's a middle school boy and he has no frame of reference for what you talk about or yes. what you like or anything. And so the only shared experience he has with you is that game. So right. he, he's just trying to make a connection with you based on the one thing that he knows you have in common. Yes. Absolutely. So like, yeah. So like, you know, a great, a great way to move forward with that is to either create another shared experience like you know, go over to the Nintendos and and play Mario Kart with him or sit down and ask him about what he does at school or what he likes to do once he gets home or what TV show he watches. Like, you know, just lead him into a a further relationship. And I think that so many of the things we're talking about, we can see in typical people just in different places along their journey instead of kind of being collected in the present moment. Exactly. Yeah. And sometimes like I have found with with some clients um, or parents have reported to me that if they've just brought it to their attention, hey, you know, that's the uh, the third time that we've talked about that. We can talk about other things. Let me ask you about how your day was, you know what I mean? And, and yeah. kind of direct them, you know, and with a with a neurotypical middle schooler, you might say that once and they might go, oh, OK, got it. In future reference, I'll do this. But it's because of that connectivity problem. I think that people on the spectrum sometimes, um, you know, it's, it, we, we've been taught that like they need repetition. I don't mm-hmm. think it's the repetition for repetition's sake that they need. It's the gentle reminder. Yeah, it's those bumpers. Yeah, totally, totally. Wow. Um, well, let's transition into talking about a movie. Cool. So what, what movie did you bring for us to talk about today? So I brought Lars and the Real Girl. Lars and the Real Girl. Um, when you mentioned this movie, I had only seen it one time before watching mm-hmm. it to prepare for today. And the one time that I saw it, which was many years before grad school, many years before going to my own therapy, like I had a very different response than watching it this time. Um, Interesting. Yeah, I think I would put it in the same category as watching things like uh, Step Brothers, or I even had kind of a similar experience post grad school. Uh, Parks and Recreation is one of my favorite shows ever, mm-hmm. but at some point in grad school, uh, like a page got turned, and the character of Andy Dwyer, I started having a tough time with, ah. and it's like, and it's like I can't tell if they're writing this character 
in a way that's supposed to be funny or if they have, you know, kind of a disorder. Like if there's right. if there's something diagnosable about them and and inside of me, I keep vacillating between like laughing and feeling like pain, like sorrow or or you know, feeling shame for them, right. you know, or maybe feeling anger for them at the way that other people interact with or treat them. And I had a real tough time watching this movie the first time because that's what I kept thinking was, oh, Lars is in some trouble yeah. and people need to help him. And then, you know, watching it this time, very, very different reaction. But we'll get there. Okay. Um, what was it about this movie that attracted you to it that made you want to talk about it? You know, I just when I saw it, which was quite a few years ago, too, was I think my kids were babies um, or a lot younger anyway. Um, it, it just, it just stuck with me. It was, it was a movie that, um, I didn't expect, like I, I had never heard of it and we just kind of, I guess, ordered it on, at that time, probably on VHS or something, <laughs> <laughs> showing my age. It was probably on DVD through when Netflix did DVDs. Yeah. Um, they still do. You can do still get really? DVDs from Netflix. Yep. How about that? Well, yeah. And sometimes so they, they have something that. on DVD that they don't have on the streaming. Oh, nice to know. Um, yeah, so this is just one of those movies where I was like, oh, it looks interesting. Let's give it a try. And I was just so pleasantly surprised by it because I think because of the way it made me feel, I was surprised at the way that I felt, which hmm. was more of a um, uplifted. Like I just, I love, what I love most about this movie is that what I took away was community is so important and because mm -hmm. of the people that surrounded him in his time of need, he was able to heal. Yeah. So he, he was able, I, you know, and I'm assuming that he goes on to do better. I, I leave that movie going, well, I mean, he's still going to need to go to therapy, but he's, he's better than he was. <laughs> yeah, I, I felt very hopeful at the end, mainly because of that very last interaction between him and, um, oh, no, I'm forgetting her name, the girl. Margo. Margo, Yes. Yeah. Um, so like the too long didn't read version of a plot synopsis is basically at the beginning of the movie, you know, we're introduced to, um, I guess the first character we see is Lars's sister-in-law. Yes. Um, and then, you know, he lives with his sister-in-law and his brother. And at some point, the, both of their parents... Well, I think their mom left and their dad, they stayed with their dad, but then since their dad has passed away. Yes. And Lars, you know, seems to be withdrawn, uh, seems to be, you know, just kind of like keeping to himself and really struggling to even, at least at the beginning, talk to his brother and sister-in-law. Seems mm -hmm. like he's got a little bit of an easier time with his sister-in-law. Yes. Um, and I think that's because of the way she approaches him. So, you know, in, in watching this now, of course, you know, watching it then, I was like, oh, what a sweet movie. It made me really feel great. And this time, like as, as time went on and I started thinking about it and treating more autism families, I was like, this dude is definitely on the spectrum. Hmm. Like I just, I think he's, I just think he is. And I think he probably would be an Asperger's type case, but there's, there's little hints that tell you that there's always been something a little bit more um, unusual with Lars, because at one point the brother says, you know, that he left and it, he apologizes to Lars and says, I'm so sorry that I left as quickly as I did. I couldn't wait to get out of the house, but I should have never left you alone with dad. I should have known mm -hmm. that that would have been upsetting for you. And there yeah. was almost like this protection, you know, so you don't think that that was like an over-function? You think that was like an adaptation? I think it was a little of both. Okay. Yeah, because I think re there's a real fine line between <laughs> adaptation and over-function. Because believe me, I over-function every day for myself. Oh, yeah. And I know oh, I yeah. do it, right? Um, it's just easier sometimes than, than going through the, well, you can get your own apple juice and knowing it's going to mm -hmm. take 15 minutes rather than two seconds. Um, so yeah, I, and that, and if you notice, I mean, he carries this blanket, this small piece of blanket that his mom made for him when she was pregnant and she dies in giving birth to him is, okay. Is what okay. Yeah. 
Okay. I don't think I picked up on that. Yeah, Yeah. they weave it in and it's subtle um, because later when he's, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead, if that matters, but later when when he's talking to the therapist and he starts talking about um, his girlfriend, Bianca, he makes the story up that, well, Bianca's mom died giving birth to her. And she says, oh, just like you. Oh, and I think that's the only time that it's really mentioned. But there's little hints to it, like, oh, this is the blanket. His mom, because he's leaving the brother's house at one point and says, "Do you have my, do you have my blanket?" Yeah, and they have to go grab it, and they do it really quickly, like, "Oh my gosh, did we lose the blanket? Like, we have to give it back to him." So these, yeah. there's these little things where you're like, you know, for me, I just saw autism spectrum written all over it. Yeah, I think so. I think that I maybe had just imagined that his mom had left for some reason and his dad stayed. But that I do remember him. Yeah, with the therapist now. So, uh, I mean, kind of the meat of the story is he does have a job. Uh, It's some kind of office job um, where he's in a cubicle and his cubicle mate, he comes in one day and it seems like it's it's not surprising that his cubicle mate is looking at somewhat sexually explicit uh, content on his computer at work. Right. Um, But in this particular day, he's looking at um, like sex dolls. Yeah. Um, And like high end ones too, not just like an inflatable. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like customizable multiple thousands of dollars kind of, kind of thing. And he tells Lars about it. And it looks like in the moment, Lars is kind of batting that away. Yeah. But then a giant wooden crate gets delivered to his home. Right. And, (laughs) and he has, he has ordered one and then begins to, uh, I guess, interact with it Mm -hmm. and expect others around him to interact with it as if she is a real person. Yes. Yes. Thus the name of the movie, Lars and the Real Girl. Which is hilarious. I just think that first scene, it's almost like part of you doesn't want to laugh because you know he's really a troubled person, but it's hysterical when they cut to the scene at the dinner table. You know, Lars gets his brother and sister-in-law all excited like I've I've got a girl I want to bring over and they're like oh my gosh that's wonderful and then they cut to the scene and they're all sitting at the dinner table including you know Bianca the blow-up doll um and they're having this conversation as if she's real but they you know obviously she's not and just the looks on their faces it, it's a it's a feeling for me as a parent that I like and am familiar with in kind of laughing at the absurdity you're not laughing at the person, but in my household, we do a lot of laughing. Um, mm-hmm. My husband is just, he's a really funny person and he always has been, but he's able to kind of take our situation with my son and really bring a lot of humor to it. And sometimes they're jokes that like we would never share with anybody else because they're just too dark. <laughs> but um, you know, <laughs> we just, we can have this very dark, biting sense of humor. And that scene at that dinner table just resonated with me so much. I was like, if I were going to write a movie, like that's exactly what I would do. Like you just have to laugh at the absurdity of it. So yeah. it's just so well done, I think. I I think that the closest that I could get to describing the first time that I watched the movie, my experience with it is exactly the way that the brother like acts for the majority of the movie. Wow. Like it seems like you know Lars has you know really two groups two two groups of people form in their behavior towards him and Bianca in the movie and the groups are his brothers in one group and literally everybody else is in the other and it's <laughs> right. and it's everybody else kind of feels invited to participate in this exercise in coping with Lars right and and they they do his brother I think is feeling like he's being forced into what he would consider is you know uh stepping outside of reality yes like it it seems like his brother is saying like you're trying to drag me kicking and screaming away from the real world and that's not 
the answer, but nobody else. And, and I think everybody else knows what's going on. Mm-hmm. They just have a different perspective than his brother. And I think that that was my first experience watching the movie is the whole time I was feeling like the brother, like this is wrong. This is I not, th- there's something like pathologically wrong here versus this time. And I, and I don't, I mean, yeah, I'm on the other side of grad school. I'm a practicing therapist, like all that stuff. But I, I can't, I hope that that's not the only thing that, that was a change agent in this. Like this time when I watched it, I just felt a lot more compassion for Lars. Yes, yes. And what's interesting is when they, they so they take him to um, this doctor um, and she, because I guess they live in like North Dakota or someplace like. Somewhere mm-hmm. snowy and secluded. Yeah. And, and I, they keep commenting on what a small town it is. Everybody knows everybody. And this particular um, doctor is not only a physician, but she's also um, a psychologist. Um, so when they bring him to the, the doctor, um, and I'm trying to think of why they bring him. Oh, I think because they, they convince him to bring Bianca to the doctor. Yes. You yeah. know, because he makes up a story about her, um, and says she's here from another country. And so I think it's the sister-in-law that says something to him, like, you know, it might be a good idea to, to take her to the doctor. Um, well, and Bianca, he has to get her around in a wheelchair too, naturally. Yes. yes. And so yes. I think it was something related to that, that, you know, yes. oh, maybe you should get her checked out. Like, right. Let's go and get her checked. Yeah. So that's how they get him there. And, um, which is interesting because then, um, she starts asking how Bianca has been feeling and he starts saying that she's got symptoms of some sort where she's not quite feeling right. Mm -hmm. So I think he's, he, what he's essentially doing is projecting all of the things he's experiencing onto Bianca. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then the doctor tells him, I want you to bring her in every week and she's going to have these treatments and then she's got to rest after the treatment. So while she rests, you and I'll talk. Mm-hmm. Um, which is an interesting ethical dilemma as a therapist. Now I'm like, well, he didn't, in, he didn't consent to that treatment. Like he, oh, <laughs> technically, yeah. technically he didn't consent, but I, it was okay because, uh, you know, so she would basically treat him while she was talking to him, um, each time. And she yeah. was able to, um, I mean, he has a lot of sensory issues. You find out that he doesn't like to be hugged and that he doesn't even like to be touched. It hurts him. Yeah, it hurts him. It's fascinating. Is that something that is typical uh, that you see in autism or Asperger's? Yes. Yes. Um, either an undersensitivity or an oversensitivity to touch. Mm-hmm. And some people don't Do have find it, at it all, in, but... Yeah. Do you find it in other senses as well? Because I know with Caleb... Mm-hmm. Uh, sound is a big thing with him. Yeah. It basically, all of the senses can be affected by, you know, what we call sensory issues or sensory integration yeah. issues. Yeah. It can be smells. Um, we have to be really careful in our office. We have, um, a essential oil diffuser, but I won't allow anything synthetic, like no candles or any, um, air fresheners or perfumes or anything like that. Um, cause it's just, it's too much for them. Are there certain scents that you have found, you know, work and don't work? Depends on the person. You know, it's funny you say that because um, the other therapist that works here had lemon going one day and she said, you know, I've been tracking it. And the majority of my clients on the spectrum, when they come in, they say, can we turn that off? I don't like that smell. So she's like, I I really want to kind of see, is this just, is this an autism thing? Or like, (laughs) she was like, does the smell bother you? I said, no, it smells really good. It was just like lemongrass, I think. And, um, And it was too strong. They didn't like it. Interesting, huh? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that. So there's a an intervention that I read about a long time ago that I've used with some clients. Uh, are you familiar with Richard Rohr at all? Uh, I've heard of the name. Okay, so he's a he's a Franciscan priest. He has a place out in shoot somewhere in New Mexico. I can't remember where. Okay. Called the Center for Action and Contemplation. Um, but this is not a thing that's specific to him. It's just his term for it is what I've ended up using called observing the other, where basically, you know, if if an individual is experiencing heavy emotion to have them practice picturing zooming out of their body, Mm -hmm. looking down upon themselves, not down as in pity, but just, you know, separate from, 
right. and uh, asking the other or even just trying to perceive, you know, what is it that they need right. and then practicing offering them what they need. Um, mm-hmm. Just because so many times we have, you know, such an easy time meeting the needs of others, but sometimes we have a tough time meeting the needs of ourselves. And right. so it seems like it's almost, you know, with the therapist slash physician and Lars, Bianca allows him to zoom out, you know, and with a different perspective, talk about things that he's never been able to talk about before. Yes. Yeah. It gave him distance and it gave him the language, I think, to be able to talk about it without too much emotion flooding him. Right. So he yes. couldn't talk about here's how I feel. And you find out later, just as a trauma therapist, I found it so interesting that um, it appeared that because the sister in law in the story was pregnant, Lars was fearing that was kind of the trigger. Right. So in PTSD, a lot of times um, you'll you'll have a trigger and the trigger might have nothing to do with what happened to you but it might be similar it might be a reminder of adjacent exactly exactly so because the sister got pregnant um i think that that set off lars's um depression really for lack of a better word uh, because his trauma was that his mom died giving birth to him and he never really had a chance to uh grieve it or reconcile it you know, and then dad died. So it wasn't too long after dad died, but it seemed like at first I thought, well, the dad dying was really what set him off, but they said it was a few years ago. And then at one point the doctor says to him, how do you feel about the baby that's coming? And he just starts panicking. Yeah. He literally has a panic attack in the office. Huh. And he just assumes that she could die. Like she, she, she could die having this baby. Which I think, I think if you if you look at that through a trauma lens, that assumption makes a lot of sense. You know, yeah. without that trauma lens, it seems so unrelated. Right. But with the trauma lens, you know, this is something that's this kind of basic fear that I think all of us deal with at some point or another, you know, that the people that I love aren't going to be around forever. Right. Um, it's kind of tied up to use you know, like a comic book kind of term, it's kind of tied up, tied up in his origin story. Yes. Like he's here and in order for him to be here, his mom, you know, passed away. Mm. And so here he has this, this person who maybe he's closer with than anybody else in his world. Right. And she's pregnant. Yeah. Yeah. And so is he going to lose her? Yeah, and it's interesting um, that once the doctor says, you know, we've come a really long way in medicine since your mom had you, and the chances of her dying, giving birth are really, really slim. Like, she's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was kind of like a revelation to him, like, really? Like, but how can someone reassure you things are going to be okay if you can't express or maybe don't even know what it is that's wrong? He just kind of starts avoiding the sister-in-law and the brother Oh, yeah. And nobody knows why. And the sister-in-law especially is like, darn it, I'm going to figure this out because she's just – she's one of my favorite characters in the whole show besides Bianca. Mm-hmm. Bianca is my yeah. favorite. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of who the older lady is that at some point comes and picks Bianca up to take her to an event without Lars. Yes. She's my She's one of my favorites because at some point, like, Lars – asks to have a, a private moment with Bianca at the car because he has not, since ordering her, yes. you know, he has not been without her. They've been together, except maybe when he goes to work. Um, and then at this point, you know, somebody is asking to take Bianca to something without Lars. And he, I think, experiences, you know, like fear, some separation anxiety, things like that. And so he's kind of like in a private moment, quote unquote, kind of yelling at her, like arguing. Yes. And then, yes. and then the, the other lady was like, you know, listen, you need to change your tone. Don't be using that, that tone of voice with her. Right. You know, she had, she, she gets to have her own life. She gets to have her own friends. Yeah. <laughs> and she does, she takes on a, this is just the part that I love and I find so hysterical. Not only did they embrace this idea, like, okay, we got to pretend that she's real. 
Um, but they, they like at one point somebody says um, she is like a P, she's been nominated for the PTA or I don't know they're like they're putting her on boards hospital mm-hmm. board for PTAs and she's going out and having her hair done and like everybody is just really embracing this and yeah, yeah. so that's when he gets upset and uh, and that that character is pretty awesome because she just sits him down and says you know you're you're just gonna have to respect that she has feelings and that i think starts to separate her from him right because he's got all of his own stuff invested in her and now Mm -hmm. she kind of starting to almost differentiate from him oh you know what's interesting i don't think i put this together in my head it's almost like this was a form of triangulation Mm -hmm. like lars you know had all of this tension within himself that he couldn't bear and right. so he brings in Bianca as a way to help him bear it. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. One of the things, you know, as as we were talking about Lars, kind of his, I guess, journey or certainly the, the narrative of this particular slice of his story, you know, as we were talking about what kind of set that off and it being the sister, you know, I couldn't help but think about even in the life of Lars, which seems to be the life of a person with some, you know, not neurotypical, you know, kind of systems inside of himself. Mm -hmm. um, There's so many things that he's attempting that all of us have attempted. Yes. Like there's so many kind of mile markers on his journey and his development that all of us have gone through as well. Like, dealing with fear, dealing with the possibility and the fear of losing a loved one, trying to navigate social situations, trying to communicate what's inside of us and ask for what we need. Like all of us do that stuff all the time. It's just he's having a, you know, a a non-typical, a different uh, type of struggle doing it. And I think that that's, that's one of the things that I go back to and think about all the time just in my relationship with my brother is, you know, the times that I feel maybe frustrated because I feel like I don't understand him, Mm -hmm. you know, it's not because he's doing something wrong. He's, he's trying to live his life the same way that I live mine. Um, And it's kind of my catchphrase that I say all the time. I got a, I got a bad case of being a person, you know, Caleb, Caleb has a bad case of being a person too. Yes. Yet his experience is different than mine. And for me to, I guess, in my worst moments, um, assume that his is an experience that's less than mine, Mm -hmm. you know, and and thus maybe treating him differently, or I should say treating him with less respect than I would for another person, I think really you know, to put it like really bluntly, like dehumanizes him and lessens him. Right. Um, And, and really instead of kind of taking that time, which let's be honest, we don't always have tons and tons and tons of time. Like you said earlier, to sit down and try to do all of the, you know, interventions and work to try to understand. Mm -hmm. But, but really it's a, it's a long run. It's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So exactly. if we don't take take that time over the long run to try to understand as a person, what are your struggles? What are you trying to get out? What are you trying to experience in your life? And how can I help you do that? Right. You know, that's that's really what we see every one of the characters in the movie, including the brother later on, really get to. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Well, and it's so interesting because the brother, if you kind of clue into his verbiage, when this first starts to happen, and I think it might even be in the scene where they're talking to the doctor and the doctor says, you have to, you know, go along with it, pretend that that she's real. And he starts arguing and then the doctor says, well, what choice do you have? Mm -hmm. Like you can either lean into this or or fight it, but it's there. So why don't we go with it? And what he says is, all right, but I just need everybody to know this is not my fault. Right. So he makes it really clear. This is not my fault. And later on when stuff kind of starts to unravel, like when he starts watching his wife pretend that Bianca is real and, you know, she's in the wheelchair and sitting at the kitchen table. And, um, he's, he says again to his wife, you know, this is not my fault. 
and nobody's accusing him of it. You know, it just kind of keeps yeah. coming out that he's thinking this is his fault, obviously. Which is his shame and guilt over, you know, what he apologizes for later leaving. Yes. Yes, it's, exactly. It's, it's something that he's carrying with him. Which didn't cause the problem at all. Right. Um, but the story it, that he's telling himself is, you know, yes. if I would have stayed, everything would have been perfect and great and fine. Exactly. And that's a narrative that I hear from autism parents all the time. If I had only done this, if I hadn't done that, you know, what if, you know, they, it's, I think it's natural when something goes wrong with your child as a parent to look back and go, what could I have done differently to, to avoid this? And, oh, like uh, in a, in a blaming kind of way? Yeah. So yeah. are they like, uh, is it something like, um, are they looking back at their past maybe, maybe before, you know, pregnancy or something and saying, you know, oh, you know, this is happening because I did this back then. Right. Like, right. Do they, like, oh, do I they... had a glass of wine before I, I knew the pregnancy test was positive. Did I cause this? Oh. Or, you know, um, maybe it was because I didn't. And, and I went through the same thing. You know, maybe this was because my husband and I were fighting a lot at that time. You know, maybe it yeah. was because, you know, and you just, it, when I educate a parent on this isn't anything you did or didn't do, um, it just is. That's actually really hard for yeah. a parent to deal with. Like, what do you, what do you mean? I, like, I have to actually just go, nothing I could have done. Mm -hmm. um, do you, yeah. f do you have anybody that comes in that struggles with kind of a religious or spiritual component to it? Like I'm yes. being, I'm being punished because I did or didn't do this or that. Yes. Yes. I hear a lot of that. Um, and it's in fact, in my own narrative, I didn't think I was being punished, but I remember kind of saying to God, you know, I've done a lot of crap for you. Like, it was just ridiculous mm. to say out loud, but like, I remember being like, there, you're going to let this happen to me because, mm -hmm. you know, look at all this stuff that I've, I've been in the church and active for years and I've helped with this and I've done that almost as if like I was owed something. Um, mm -hmm. and whether that comes from a spiritual perspective or not, I think we all kind of feel that sometimes like, well, I didn't do anything wrong. Why is this happening to me? Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, yeah, I see that a lot. I think it, I think it makes a lot of sense though. I mean, I think it's a part mm -hmm. of like, you know, the Kubler-Ross kind of stages of grief thing. And I think especially one of the things that, you know, I think people struggle with a lot in kind of conceptualizing God is, you know, if, if you go to one you know, far end of the spectrum, um, different kind of spectrum. Uh, yes. You know, God is is in control, and His actions are what causes everything. So He's He's all of the good things, and He's all of the bad things. Everything is a result of a decision He made. And the the complete other end of the spectrum is He's you know hands off. And so he's like, everything that's happening, especially the bad, is allowed, quote unquote, to happen by him. Right. And in, in both cases, it's like this uh, external locus of control. It's like, yes. you know, we have no ability to influence anything in the world. We're just kind of, I guess, spectators or something. Maybe yes. not even that. I don't know. <laughs> Which can put us in a real victim mentality because when yes. I think about the patients that I have that have had um, what I would consider to be toxic faith beliefs. So a toxic faith belief is anything that just psychologically and emotionally is not going to be good for you. I mean, in basic terms, if we don't yeah. think we have a locus of control, um, I don't care what your belief system is. That's not healthy. <laughs> yeah. And I don't think it's accurate. Because there are, there's always something that you have control over, even if it's not the oh, actual yeah. outcome of the situation. Um, so yeah, we, I see a lot of people who come in and will just, you know, take those faith beliefs and either twist them up into really weird formations or um, become a real mm -hmm. victim in it. You know, well, you things know, like, oh, I guess this about... is my cross to bear, you know, like, oh, this just must yeah. be my cross to bear. Well, no. <laughs> And I think what's interesting about, you know, both sides of that spectrum I talked about is, you know, it, it in both places, you're trying to conceptualize and understand something. 
and you're trying to, in a very binary way, put a handle on it so you can take your finger and point it and say, well, this is the reason why this happened. And I think that like with us as humans, with us as, us as people, we have a really tough time with ambiguity. We have yes. a really tough time with gray. And so when something bad happens, it, it's easier for us to say, this is all my fault mm -hmm. or this is all your fault because then there's stuff we can do. So if it's all my fault, maybe I can change and it gets better. If it's all your fault, then maybe I can, you know, cut you off or mm -hmm. I can, you know, explain to you all the things you've done wrong and you can change and it'll be better. But if it's nobody's fault, then there's not really as simple of, of an answer. Yes, yes. So you can see why um, Brene Brown says that certainty is a, an armor against shame. Yeah. yeah. So that we like to be certain. And when we're certain, then we don't have to experience that shame spiral of maybe I'm not good enough. Yeah. And, and I think that one of the things to tie in kind of, you know, shame research and stuff. So um, a, a book that's had a, a tremendous impact on my life, Chip Dodd's The Voice of the Heart, uh, he talks about shame being the message that our heart sends when, you know, we experience something that shows that we have limitations. Oh, yeah. And the gift, and he says, you know, no, no feeling is either good or bad. Feelings are neutral. They just are. But every feeling has a gift. So if you lean into the feeling and you try to understand it, you try to engage in the experience of it, you can receive a gift from it. If you deny the feeling, then you end up operating in an impaired state of the feeling. And mm -hmm. so with shame, you know, the message it gives us is uh, that, that I have limitations. So the gift of shame is humility that mm -hmm. leads that leads to relationship. Wow. And so if, you know, I, I can kind of like fight myself to sit in the gray, to sit in the ambiguity, to realize, okay, I have limitations. And in a really real, you know, way to talk about, you know, both of our shared experience and, and a lot of your clients, you know, to realize I have limitations in, in knowing how to deal with and help my loved one with autism. Right. You know, that's going to lead us to a place of humility and going to someone, if it's a mental health professional, if it's a doctor, if it's our community, if it's our, you know, whoever, and saying, I can't do this on my own. Will you help me? Yeah. You know, versus uh, the impairment of shame, which I, I had Chip on the show, you know, last year and, and joked with him about this. We could have come up with a better name uh, is toxic shame and toxic yeah. shame is that inner voice. I always tell my clients, you know, if you're trying to tell the difference between healthy shame and toxic shame, just picture a hand. And if the hand is outstretched in an effort to take your hand to pull you along, that's healthy shame. Mm -hmm. If the, the hand is, you know, formed into a finger that's wagging down at you, you know, that's toxic shame. Right. You know, and toxic shame is that thing that buries us. It's that thing that says you're not good enough. You're a piece of crap. Or I think the most common thing in my internal life is, you know, well, a real fill in the blank would know what to do here. Yes. A real man, a real, you know, a uh, Christian, a real therapist, a real whatever. Yep. You know, thereby implying that I'm not that. Right. And so, you know, in that kind of, you know, the reason why we always try to find that kind of it's either my fault or it's somebody else's fault it's never nobody's fault is because that's ambiguity and so we have to deal with what you said our shame we have to find the humility to ask for help yes yeah and that's really hard and you know something that was so interesting to me about that movie is they didn't hesitate to go right to you know in their case it was their church community and say we need some help with this will you guys play along oh that's uh, right they went straight to the priest yeah they went right to because there's like a, a the next scene i think after that dinner table scene they're sitting with some of their friends from church and the pastor and basically saying here's the deal and a few of the people um the men actually not to pick on men but a few of the the ladies were like okay yeah no problem we'll do this and the men were like wait 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 hold on this is a little bit 
a little mm -hmm. bit weird, a little bit out there. And, and one of them even says, well, um, you're not going to let him take it to church, are you? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I'll, I'll pretend I'll play along, but you're not going to bring it to church. And they all look at the pastor and the pastor's like, well, what would Jesus do? You know, it, it's kind of funny because you think. <laughs> Which I laughed out loud to. Right. <laughs> like that, that as a process question in that moment. You know, what Perfect. would Jesus do about a, a, a young man wanting to take a, a sex doll into the sanctuary during a worship service? And, yeah. And they, they, and then so the next scene, she's in church and she's holding a hymnal and it's just, it's hilarious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's hilarious. And, uh, and it's just. And she's sitting and sometimes he's so attentive. Like he like bends down and puts his hand on her back and like, yeah. you know, turns a page for her or asks her a question or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's just it's just brilliant i just love it and you know what i mm -hmm. um i read uh some trivia about it i guess my netflix or wherever i know oh, i watched it on amazon i think had like trivia pop-up things that would come up if you wanted them to and one of mm -hmm. the things it said is that when they made the movie they gave bianca her own trailer and her <laughs> own hair and makeup people because they wanted everybody to truly treat this I guess, I mean, I guess that's method acting. If you know anything about acting, they just yeah. totally lived it, right? So mm -hmm. uh, I thought that was hilarious. You know what, what, what's something that it makes me think of that they kind of went to the church next is that, you know, by and large, that's a lot of people's first step in trying to figure out how to deal with, you know, emotional turmoil or maybe a mental illness or just needs that they don't quite know how to conquer. Yeah. is to go to, you know, their uh, kind of center of faith and talk to, you know, somebody who's a faith leader to them. Right. Yeah. And the response of that person in that community makes all the difference. Yeah. And I'll tell you, the response of that particular uh, priest there was tremendous. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot better than, you know, a lot that I've seen. Um before yes yeah it is tremendous and at the end i mean I, I i guess you don't really have spoilers in your show because we're talking about a movie nah. okay. I guess this movie came out like 15 years ago something like that i think so, so. It's, been a, it's a pretty old one um yeah. but you know at the end bianca dies and um and lars is the one that um that basically he he's writing the narrative as he goes along right so he mm -hmm. makes bianca die and they have a funeral for her and the um, the pastor at the church talks, you know, basically gives her eulogy and talks about how she brought the community together and how much she gave back. And it's just, it's, it's almost, you almost want to giggle, but I cried through, I, I mean, I've seen this movie a couple of times yes. and I literally cry at the end every time <laughs> during that scene because it's just so beautiful how they include Lars in such a intimate way. Oh, so here's a question I didn't think of while I was watching it. You know, you mentioned the part where he's with the physician therapist. Mm -hmm. He is speaking about issues that Bianca has when they really are, you know, him. Yeah. Was that eulogy about Lars and not Bianca? Mm, I do think so. I do. S so in the same way that it gave Lars enough distance to, or I should say she, I'm sorry, Bianca, um, in the same <laughs> way that she gave Lars the distance to be able to talk about these things safely, yeah. you know, was this kind of, you know, them using concepts and language that Lars has used in order to speak right back to him and say what he meant to them? Mm, absolutely. That's absolutely. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think later when Margot is talking to him, she says something about, you know, you brought Bianca to us. You know, he was, I think he's standing at the grave and he's saying something mm -hmm. about, you know, it's not going to be the same. And she says, yeah, but you're the one that brought her to us. So you can continue, you know, are we still going to see, you know, more of you? Because I've liked seeing more of you, that kind of thing, even though Bianca's not around now. So, yeah, I, I do think that that is what's happening. Yeah. I think something that I really struggled with the first time was what Margot saw in him. Because mm. she's clearly, like, into him. She's clearly, 
yeah. you know, attracted to him. And I think with the perspective that I had during that first time, like, well, there's something wrong with him. And I, you know, like I, I'm a marriage and family therapist, systems thinking, all that. And so I believe, you know, water rises to meet its own level. Health is attracted to health. Unhealth is attracted to unhealth mm -hmm. in whatever level that it's at. And so, and I did not, I did not have those thoughts at the time of the first time that I watched this, mm -hmm. but I just, I just kept thinking at that time, like what, it seems like she's, you know, typical she's got it all together she has a big group of friends she dates she does this that and then he's a recluse so what is it that she you know but i think this time especially if i'm considering his talk to the doctor and the eulogy mm -hmm. you know as a vehicle by which he's able to both give and receive from his heart yeah. i think it makes a lot more sense yeah. Well, and Margot, in my mind, um, was not 100% neurotypical. I found really? her, yeah, I found her a little bit neurodiverse um, in that I think she saw in Lars aspects of that kind of herself. Um, and, and I say that because she's a little bit socially awkward. I mean, she has friends and all of that. And that's, you know, but she's got this, um, this stuffed bear. That's right. Right? Which is like yeah. her uh, Bianca. That's her blanket. Right? That's her, her blanket. Oh. Yeah. So she's got this stuffed bear. This is my absolute favorite scene, by the way. When um, toward the end where Bianca is starting to get sick, right? So you see this, this um, shift start to happen. Bianca starts to get sick and Lars starts to pay more attention to Margot simultaneously. And at one point that coworker um, takes Margot's stuffed bear and hangs it by a noose you know, and, you know, to joke around and hangs it because they apparently they go back and forth. She steals his action figures and, uh, and then Margot, you know, gets her bear stolen. And so she it takes the bear and comes in and yells and at him and then goes in the break room and starts crying. So Lars follows in and she's actually not, she says, I'm not crying about the bear. She's crying because she broke it off with this other guy that she was dating. Mm -hmm. Um, but this bear was like really, really important to her. And then, you know, somebody went and mistreated it. It's the cutest scene because Lars comes in and starts talking to her. And <laughs> as he's talking to her, he's taking off the noose and he's giving the bear CPR. Yeah. With and his, uh, with just two of his fingers on each hand. Oh my gosh. It's just the most <laughs> precious thing I've ever seen. And he's like, tell me more about that. And then he's like putting, you know, giving it mouth to mouth and like, and then he, <laughs> basically um you know they end up making a date like to get together yeah. um but i just i love that scene but i i feel like margo can relate to him in a uh, lot of ways that for me watching it this time was i think the difference maker because something about that scene made me think he's got it in him because yes. he's being so compassionate and so yeah. engaging and understanding in that moment by giving that bear CPR. Yes. He he is he is doing for her what she and the rest of the town had done for him. Yep. Exactly. And that's his lang like that's almost his love language. Like he he need you know he's got the blanket, then he's got Bianca and he's got like this what I'd call a transitional object, right? A lot of kids <laughs> and a lot of people on the spectrum will have a transitional object. Yeah. Um, that's important to them. Uh, so yeah, I, I just, I think I thought it was just brilliant. Oh, wow. You know, what's interesting. And I, I have not, I literally, this is a brand new thought. Uh, so for Caleb, you know, there's a lot of things that become ritual or routine mm -hmm. and a lot of them involve objects. Some of them involve, you know, uh, just things that he does, like a lot of his eating, is ritualized or routinized. Like when I was in, I want to say high school or something, every Tuesday night he had a mixing bowl. He would pop popcorn, put it in the mixing bowl. On top of that, put some dry roasted peanuts and some saltine crackers. Okay. And that was his dinner on Tuesday nights, but only <laughs> Tuesday nights. Okay. Right. You know, currently he eats a different breakfast every day of the week. And like on certain days, he makes two hash browns in the toaster oven. On Fridays, this is the only one I can remember for sure. Fridays, it's Pop-Tarts. Okay. 
But it's, you know, everything happens on a certain day. During the summer, on Thursdays, him and my mom go to the Pizza Hut all-you-can-eat buffet. Okay. It's only during the summer. It's only on Thursdays. Other than that, he doesn't want Pizza Hut at all. (laughs) Um, There's a certain point in the spring where he will no longer wear long pants, like blue jeans. He wears shorts. Right. And when that happens, he switches to either wearing... um, white tennis shoes or sandals and then there's a certain point in the fall where he will no longer wear shorts even though he's in the middle of south carolina and sometimes in the fall it's still 90 something degrees right he wears long pants and he will no longer wear white tennis shoes he wears black tennis shoes (laughs) and what's what's interesting is i can never figure out what the origin of these things are and yet, and I can never figure out when or if they're going to end, but there are times, and, and one of these just happened this Christmas. There are times when he just ends something. Okay. So for years and years and years now, like, I mean, maybe back to when I was in high school, every Christmas he has gotten a Three Stooges wall calendar. Okay. Every Christmas. This year, he didn't want it. He wanted an Andy Griffith wall calendar. Oh, and when I when I walked into the house and I saw that it was a different calendar, I was like bowled over. Right. We're talking like 20 something years of yes. the same calendar. And I was like, buddy, what what in the world? Like, where's the three stooges? Why do you have Andy Griffith? Right. And he and he looked at me and he said, because it's time to move on. Wow. And I was like, what? <laughs> Oh my gosh, Josh, you were you were like the scene where they're in the hospital and Bianca is dying and and the and they say Bianca's dying and the brother says, Can't you do something to stop this? Yeah. <laughs> and yes. I'm like, wait a minute, you didn't need, what you should be happy she's dying, but they're like, No, you can't let her die. Yeah. And the doctor's like, It's not me, Lars is doing it. Lars is calling all the shots. Like Because it's become this like baby. shared experience. It's almost right. like there was some kind of block in between the brother and Lars for so long. And Bianca helped move that block. Yep. And so the brother is thinking the only way for there to not be a block is for there to be a Bianca. Right. But what um, if he doesn't need it anymore? And then what he, if he doesn't gets need it to anymore? decide that, which I love yeah. because so often, like I remember when my children were babies, um, you know, my son would have a pacifier, you know, for the longest time. And I was like, got to get rid of this. Got to get rid of this. And you just, as a parent, are like, okay, when am I going to make this stage end? But if you follow Mm -hmm. your child's lead, they'll naturally progress, but when they're ready, not when you're ready. Yeah, and I think that's kind of like a connection that I'm making in my brain right now is maybe some of these things that are ritualized for Caleb, you know, are things that he needs. Like uh, you called it a a transitional object. Maybe it's a transitional object or a transitional um, behavior. Yep. And... When he's ready, he'll step away from it. Yes. Yep. And my my son has done, you know, similar things where um, if he's like in the middle of something, like if he's in the middle of watching a TV show or an episode of a TV show and he's been dying all day to go to the beach and I'm like, all right, buddy, we're ready to go. We we have to wait until that entire, even though it's a, a scene or a movie he's seen a gazillion a times. A million times. Still got to wait till it's over. And the credits roll Mm -hmm. and then, okay, now I'm ready to go. But Mm -hmm. if as a parent, you're like, well, he shouldn't be doing that. He should be more flexible. And so I'm going to force this. Um, You're going to be sorry that you did (laughs) because, I mean, I like to say my my son advocates for himself, which sometimes means he kicks a hole in the wall or breaks something. But that's Um, self-advocating. Not ideal, but he'll let you know. And you know what's funny is there's there's been things that – similar to that, that I struggled with for a long time with my brother. Like for instance, Caleb doesn't do future things. So if you ask him about something in the future, even if it's something, you know, he'll love automatic. No. So, you know, if you, if you said, Hey, Caleb, you know, uh, in, in three months, I'm going to take you to Disney world and I'm going to pay for everything. No, I don't want to go to Disney world. Absolutely Mm not. And you're like, and I think for the longest time I'm like, no, but, that's your favorite thing in the world. What are you talking about? 
Mm-hmm. And what I realized was it's it's this struggle with the anxiety of yes. having something in the future that maybe he can't quite like get his head around. Yes. That kind of future thinking. Yeah. yeah. So I had to kind of learn to kind of meet him, you know, really where he's at. And one of the things that I love the most about my brother is that he has this like never ending heart to help people. Mm. And so, you know, I, when I tell people about this, I oftentimes tell them that I have learned how to manipulate that, but it's not really manipulation. (laughs) But what I'll do is it like, if I, if I know that there's a movie that he wants to go see and it, you know, it makes me really sad because, you know, right now I'm living in Nashville and he's living in Columbia, South Carolina. So we're so far apart. So this doesn't get to happen as much as it used to. But if there's a movie that I, I knew he wanted to go see, you know, I couldn't say to him, you know, hey, buddy, you know, Saturday we're going to go see The Avengers. Because once again, that anxiety would get the better of him. So what I would do is I would just get the tickets and I'd wait for Saturday. Yes. And then when it was time to go to the movie, I would oftentimes say like, Caleb, is it okay? Would you would you mind helping me? I need to go get something from somewhere. Would you come help me get that? And he would go, okay. Mm-hmm. And he would jump in the car. And then as soon as we got to the movie, he was excited. Interesting. Okay. But yeah, it was just you, you didn't have this to thing inside of him. Yeah, it was just, and it was this thing inside of him that's like, oh, I get to help. Yeah. Oh, that's now the trick cool. with that is, yeah, the trick with that is though is that, you know, I also genuinely do ask him for his help. Like when I was moving to Nashville, I had to pack up all my stuff in a trailer. Mm-hmm. So he really did help me pack the trailer. Nice. I mean, so it's not, it's not just something that I pull out when I want to get him to do something. Yes. But it's something that I know he loves. And, you know, sometimes in order to, I don't know, literally like give him something, mm-hmm. I have to give it to him through an avenue that his heart is familiar with. Oh, I love the way you worded that. Yeah, his heart is familiar with, absolutely. Yeah, so you have to go with it. I mean, you have to lean into it and do what works for him. Yeah, and I I think that the brother ended up up there with Bianca. Yes. And then struggled to get out of it. (laughs) Yes, right? I mean, they all had to mourn, I think, at the, at the funeral. They all had to kind of grieve Bianca's passing. Yeah. Um, is there anything else from the movie that sticks out to you or that bears mentioning? I think I, I think when I think about like my favorite quote from the movie, right, it's when Lars is at home with Bianca and Bianca's getting sick and the church ladies come over and um, they and Lars says to them, I feel so bad that this is happening. This is all happening so close to the baby coming. And one of the ladies says, that's how life is, Lars, everything at once. And then the other lady pipes in and says, we brought casseroles, which I think is adorable. <laughs> <laughs> and then another one says, because there's like three of them, another one says, you know, we came over to sit. Like they're sitting there and one is like doing a crossword puzzle and one is knitting and one is crocheting and they're just sitting there with him. And she says, that's what people do in tragedies. They come over and they sit. They're sitting Shiva. Right. It just blew my mind. I'm like, yeah, you know, it's really that simple. It's simple, but it's not easy to sit yep. with someone in their pain. But really, all we have to do is sit. And bring casseroles. I was just going to say that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a t-shirt if I've ever seen one in my life. We brought yeah. casseroles. We brought casseroles. As well, a and it's of community and support. Yeah. I say all the time to um, the autism parents that are like newly diagnosed, I say, you know, one of the hardest things about this is nobody brings casseroles. <laughs> they don't. If your child's diagnosed with cancer, they bring casseroles. Yeah. And they ask, how can I help take them to and from therapies? When your child's diagnosed with autism, they just go, okay. Yeah. Nobody brings casseroles. Yeah. You know what? I, I, so um, I think the last book I read last year was uh, Option B. Um, okay. Cheryl, I want to say Sandberg. She's like the COO oh, yes. of, of Facebook. Right. It, was her and a- it was her and Adam Grant, which I'm coming to love like literally everything that Adam Grant does. Okay. Um, he's a professor at, at Wharton. He's a, what does he call it? Occupational psychologist? Organizational psychologist. That's it. Got it where he like studies how teams work and how, you know, 
they can work better. But this book was about grief because her husband uh, had died suddenly while they were on vacation in Mexico and she was left with two kids. And so it's all about her process of grieving. And she talked about in her life, one of the things that she really struggled with was a lot of times people want to offer support, Mm -hmm. but sometimes what they'll do is they'll say, what can I do? Mm. And then it puts the responsibility of figuring that out on the person who's grieving. Yes. Or who needs that support. And and at best, they're experiencing decision fatigue yep. because they've got to make all these decisions on how to proceed with their life. At worst, their whole, everything's blown up and they just have no idea what to do. Right. And so she said, you know, the examples of times where people offered support and it was the most helpful was when somebody would call and say, what do you want on your hamburger? Yep. Because it's like, the action's already happening, and all yep. you got to do is say no mayo, you know, extra pickles or yep. something like that. I'm doing it, so you just tell me how you want it done. Yeah, yeah. So you don't have to weigh out all the options. You yep. just receive. Absolutely. And that's that's what the casseroles are about. <laughs> exactly. But yeah. when, it, when it comes from a place of true um, – when it's truly about that person that's suffering, then that's easy to do. If it's about Mm -hmm. you, which we don't even realize we do, right? But all of us do it at some point where we're like, I want to make sure I'm the most helpful. I want other people to know I'm helping. Yeah. I'm trying to get esteem from this act, not just give. Exactly. Then it becomes about you. Because I can't tell you how many times people have tried to quote unquote help us. And it's not about us at all. It's about Mm -hmm. something they want to do. But when it's about them, you know, we've had, we had an incident one time where my son went missing for three hours. <gasps> we had police and helicopters and search dogs and everything else. And, you know, we found him and he was safe and all that. But the community, both my church community and my neighborhood, there were people who um, just dropped off food. Um, one friend that came over and she called me and just said, I'm picking up your daughter and she's going to stay at my house tonight because we didn't know how this was going to end. Yeah. Um, but it was that kind of love, really, that that had the most impact. It was just amazing. Wow. I cannot imagine how scary that was. It's happened three times. But, oh, um, gosh. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's another kind of aspect with if you have a what we call a runner or an eloper um, that can't necessarily keep themselves safe, If you're a therapist and a parent comes in and tells you my kid went missing three times and you don't understand it in the concept of autism, you could be calling Child Protective Services when you really shouldn't. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it's not necessarily due to neglect. It's sometimes the kid is faster and smarter (laughs) than we are. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, We had something similar to that happen when we were at Disney World. Uh, we were on Main Street, and it was the parade at night. Mm-hmm. And it was like my mom and I and Caleb, and I want to say my aunt and uncle and two cousins. Um, and, you know, Caleb was standing beside me, and then all of a sudden he wasn't. Mm-hmm. And we started, you know, shoving our way through the crowd, running into the stores, looking all around, just absolute panicking. Yeah. And turns out he had literally just sat straight down on the sidewalk. Oh, my gosh. You didn't had see not him. E- had not even moved. He just sat straight down. Mm-hmm. And none of us looked down. Oh, wow. <laughs> we were just panicking. Yeah. It's a terrible feeling. It was like the fear was already there in us. And then it just got activated. Yeah. And so we didn't have the ability to think about the obvious things right and like process stuff in the moment like hey instead of just looking left or right look up look down look behind you right (laughs) yep we just went straight to oh he's gone what are we gonna do right um so something that i've i've just been the most fascinated with and have loved asking my guests is tell me something that your clients have taught you? I feel like my clients have taught me to be, and this just kind of dovetails off of what we've been talking about, how to come over and sit. 
um, I'm such a problem solver and I'm so analytical and I, I like to kind of dig in there and analyze and fix and make suggestions. But when, you know, when you're a therapist, your job's not to fix, it's to mm-hmm. sit. <laughs> it's, I mean, it, sometimes it's, it's to treat, right? So sometimes you're actively treating, but that aspect of holding space, I really feel like my patients have taught me how to do that without even realizing that they've taught me. Like I, they, if they knew that I didn't really know how to do that when I first started practicing, you know, I'd be embarrassed Mm -hmm. to tell them that, but (laughs) you know, you're kind of, when you're first thrown into it, you're like, okay, I'm trained, but now what do I do? What does this look like? Now what? Yeah. So I just realized through trial and error, like the more that I would try to fix and offer suggestions and take away the pain, the more that that pain wouldn't go away. And the more that I would just sit with and validate and hold space for, they figure it out on their own. You know, it's not, I don't see myself as like this, I'm the expert and you're the person I'm going to tell these secrets to, to fix your life. It's, I'm going to equally be here with you and hold space. Yeah, that's something I've really struggled with too. Um, And I I think in the same way that you described yourself, I I think I I would say the same thing about myself. Mm-hmm. And I think something that I've realized is the times that I try to jump in and fix, it's sometimes because I'm feeling a tension inside of myself. Yep. Like in the moment, you know, kind of person of the therapist type stuff. And so I think, well, if I can fix their problem, then I'll fix mine. Right. And I think at worst, you know, it's when I forget that the client's capable and able. Yep. And so there's there's like an unconscious part of me that's thinking they can't do it right. and I need to do it. And so I, I kind of welcome and look for those reminders that, oh, no, it's it's really good to believe in them. Mm-hmm. It's necessary. Yeah, absolutely. And kind of absolutely. like going back to Lars, that's what that doctor did with him. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. She had so much faith. Oh, she oh, yeah. was so good. I loved her. Mm-hmm. So let's say that somebody was listening to our conversation today and they feel uh, a real connection with you and they would love to see you as a client. How could they do that? Sure. So I am, um, there's two ways to get to me. It pretty much goes to the same place. Um, you can get me at my website, Puzzle Peace Counseling, and, dot com, and I spell peace, P-E-A-C-E. Um, puzzle piece counseling but if you type it in either way it'll still go I bought both domain names when I realized <laughs> that cute play on words was actually going to be bad for my SEO so um, so I did buy both domain names <laughs> so puzzle piece counseling however you want to spell it dot com will go to me and then my um, my podcast is autism blueprint so if you go to autism dot com um, I help parents and professionals um, so yeah that's how you can get me and um, I'm sure that people need zero reason to come and check out your podcast, but just in case they did, I was a guest on it. Yes. Yes. You are. And that'll be, yep. that'll be coming out sometime in the future. It will be coming out soon within the next couple of weeks. Oh, I love it. Yes. So, uh, definitely go check out, uh, Jean's podcast, uh, because, oh, and actually, so when we initially kind of exchanged emails and I told you, I just recommended, uh, your podcast to my mom. She actually wrote me a text. Uh, let's see, this is Monday. So this would have been like last Tuesday mm-hmm. saying how whatever episode had just come out, she had listened to and that she loved. So, Oh, how nice. Thank um, you for sharing yeah. that with me. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, I mean, like I said, I, I, I'm constantly looking for resources yeah. that I can pass along to my mom and my family and anybody else that I meet that, you know, has a shared experience. Yeah. And so, absolutely. um, I mean, the fact that, there is a podcast that speaks to this. The fact that, you know, your practice specializes in this is something that, you know, as I was growing up as a member of a family, I never knew. And I never even knew that I would have needed. And, and it is a need that so many people have. And it's, it's just something that, uh, you know, is so helpful. And, you know, I'm so thankful as a therapist, but mostly just as a person, you know, thank you for doing what you do. It's so important. 
Oh, thank you for saying that. It's uh, it's my pleasure. I really feel like it's what I was put on this earth to do. Well, that's that's just the best the best job that any of us can have. Right. I mean, that's great. Um, Janine, thank you so much for being on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Same here. Thanks for having me. Hey, hey, everybody. Josh here. I say this all the time, but I'm going to say it again. Just my favorite episode ever of the podcast. And a couple of reasons why. One is Janine is just this treasure trove of helpful knowledge and empathy and compassion for people who are encountering and uh, just, I mean, living the challenges of having a loved one with autism. And so I think to have a chance to talk to somebody who can offer so much is kind of one side of that coin. The other side of the coin is as a person with a close and immediate uh, family member who has autism to have a chance to talk with somebody else who is living that journey is just soul refreshing. And I think that as I was kind of thinking through, you know, what I wanted to say on this wrap up, I kind of really landed on that because I think it's, it's the beauty of therapy. The beauty of therapy is getting to sit with somebody who not just hears what you're saying, but intently listens and tries to understand you in an effort to come alongside you and help you. And if that's the beauty of therapy, it's also the beauty of relationships which which make up our lives. It's just to find those connections. It's to feel heard, to feel understood, to feel uh, with, to be seen and to see. And I, I felt that as I had a chance to talk with her. And um, I'm looking forward, you know, I said on the podcast, I, I think it's the beginning of a beautiful friendship. I, I'm looking forward to having many more conversations and, and learning a lot more from Janine because she was just such a joy to have on. Um, so make sure you check out Janine's podcast, which is called Autism Blueprint. You can find a link to it in the show notes today, uh, or you can search it on uh, the podcast app or any other uh, app where you get your podcasts. Um absolutely absolutely phenomenal podcast um uh, even <laughs> the episode that i'm a guest on um so make sure you check that out uh wanted to give another announcement this will of course be the last episode of january and uh we are staring down the barrel of february so in February, here in the Therapist Theater, it's going to be Love Month, and I think that I'm going to include a bunch of yous, and so you got to say it like that. February's Love Month here in the theater, and so for all four episodes that are going to be happening in February, we're going to be covering uh, movies that center on relationships and love. Uh, it's something that I have wanted to do for a while and that I'm really looking forward to and I think is going to be on top of uh, really interesting. I think it's going to be really helpful. Um, and uh, that leads me to the third thing, which I think is the most exciting since February is Love Month. The very first episode of Therapist Theater that comes out in February is going to feature a guest that I love the most in the entire world. And that is uh, the return of Leanne Treese to Therapist Theater. My wife, uh, incredible social worker, incredible human, and I can't wait to have her back uh, so that we can chat um, about a movie about love and relationships. And I thought that it would be a great episode uh, and guest to have so that it's not just kind of talking with another person who is kind of giving me, you know, like an objective perspective on relationships, but rather somebody I'm, I'm in relationship with, my primary attachment person, my actual person, my wife. Um, 
So I, I don't think I'm, I, I've ever been as excited uh, to have a guest on um, as I am to have her on because I love her so much. So I'm really excited about that. Thanks so much for joining me in the theater. Let's raise the lights, lower the curtain, and say that for this week, the theater is closed. Wow.